is that the bill be read a second time and I call the member for Hotham. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I really appreciate the chance this morning to speak on the Appropriations Bill. Deputy Speaker, Australia faces some very significant economic challenges and today I just want to start by making the simple point that the budget that was delivered a few weeks ago is not the path to solving them. The government, and I, I note the comments of the, the member for Ryan, which are consistent with this, speaks ad nauseum about its economic credentials and the ideas about responsible fiscal management. But what I would say about this government, and one of the consistent themes um, of what Labor has been speaking about, is to look not what did they say, but look at what they do. So what do we see when we look at this budget? We see that debt is up, deficit is up, taxes, after all of the rhetoric that goes on, are up, and in fact, the tax takers a share of GDP will be higher under the budget that was delivered by Joe Hockey two weeks ago than it has been since John Howard was Prime Minister of this country, higher than any time that Labor was last in government, higher than during the finan global financial crisis. Uh, and we see the same thing, Deputy Speaker, when we look at unemployment. And this is the number one thing that Labor is worried about at the moment. We see under this budget that unemployment will continue to rise. Uh, this is more Australians who are without jobs. Um, and so I say that what I see when I look at the budget is that while the rest of the world is seeing some really important signs of recovery from the global financial crisis, uh, it seems that Australia is going, going backwards. Now, Deputy Speaker, of course, um, we did see some uh, reactions in the budget to the economic circumstances that Australia faces. Um, but what I see when I, I look at the kind of critical reforms in that budget is that they're largely short-term measures. Um, the big one that the government has been talking about is the small business tax cuts. Now, uh, to the extent that um, there's some extra assistance going to small businesses around Australia, I'm very much in favour of that. I have 5,000 small businesses that are doing innovative, terrific things right around my electorate of Hotham, and I'm really proud of the work that those people who are running those businesses do. Um, something that is going to help them survive the next few years, which look to be a little bit rocky for us economically, uh, is of course going to have my full support. But I am a little bit disturbed that this is kind of centrally uh, the, the central plank that the government has put forward in its response to the economic challenges facing Australia. Um, Deputy Speaker, when I'm talking about some of these economic challenges, I, I want to describe a couple of the things that I'm worried about when I look at where Australia is at the moment, and particularly in the kind of medium to long term. Um, and again, I'd come back to this point that nothing in the budget went to any of these important challenges. Um, one of the first points I, I, I just mentioned, Deputy Speaker, is about the declining performance of Australia's education system. What we know is that while Australia, looking at its economic history, um, has had lots of elements of luck that have made, have made us a prosperous country, um, the critical thing that has driven prosperity in recent years has been the ingenuity of Australia's people. Now, in the past, we have seen Australia's system be amongst the handful of the highest performing education systems in the world. But in recent years, uh, the tide is turning. We are seeing Australia's performance on education stagnating. We're seeing Year 12 retention rates stagnate, uh, and we're seeing the performance uh, across the system as basically the same from year to year, in some instances actually declining slightly. Um, so in the context of Australia's stagnation, we see other countries around the world making massive improvements to their education systems. So when we look at the PISA scores, which allow us to assess our system compared to others around the world, we see that Australia is, is going down, going down quite quickly. Uh, when we look at maths and science, for example, the top seven performing systems in the world are Asian education systems. And that brings me to, to my second point, Deputy Speaker, which is about um, our engagement with Asia and whether we're prepared fully to embrace that enormous opportunity that lies ahead of us in the rising middle class in Asia. Uh, we know that a billion people are going to join the middle class in Asia over the forthcoming decades. And I think when you look at the, the tenor of the debate about the Asian opportunity over the last, say, 25 years in Australia, there's been a real sense that this is a fait accompli for us. Surely we're very close to Asia, you know, we've got a lot of uh, people of Asian background living in our country, surely we're going to see huge economic benefits from this. But I think when you look at actually um, the data and how we're tracking uh, in terms of embracing that opportunity, there's a lot of cause for concern. So sure, we're exporting a lot to Asia, but most of what we're exporting is actually commodities. And I think, Deputy Speaker, that you and I, despite being in different political parties, would agree um, that we want to do more than export commodities. We want to export 
medical devices. We want to export our great ideas. We want to export more of our education to, uh, to Asia's middle class. Um, when we look at um, the share of Australian businesses, for example, that are doing foreign direct investment in Asia, we see that just 9% of Australian businesses are reaching out and doing foreign direct investment uh, into Asia. And in fact, most, the vast majority of Australian businesses have uh, no interaction with Asia at all. And the reason this is concerning, Deputy Speaker, is because when we look at businesses that have done really well in Asia, it's not something that happens quickly. In fact, it can take something like 20 years to really get a stronghold in Asia. Uh, the business environment there is so incredibly different. Um, I was in China just a few weeks ago and the economics of business in China, of course, they're just fundamentally different to what we see here in Australia. So I'm concerned about that and I do see it as an economic challenge facing the country. Um, climate change, Deputy Speaker, of course, is another one uh, that I'm very worried about and that we saw essentially nothing in the budget. Um, we know that our climate's going to warm somewhere between two and four degrees. At four degrees, uh, Australia could be incredibly difficult. Uh, life here could be incredibly difficult for our grandchildren. At two degrees, uh, there are going to be radical changes to the way that we live, to the economics uh, of life in Australia. Um, the budget said nothing on, on that either. Uh, that, that's just a little bit of a flavour, really three big issues that I see as big challenges facing the country. And again, Deputy Speaker, I just point out that nothing in the budget had anything serious to say on any of these issues. Um, and it's for that reason, Deputy Speaker, that I see this as, as a pretty small budget, small uh, in, in the sense of having a small vision for Australia and the things that government can do to actually help us tackle uh, what's ahead for us. Now, I'll talk a little bit later about the things that Labor uh, is beginning to put into the public realm of, of how we'll deal with some of these issues. But I want to talk about the, the detail of some of the policies in the budget and how they'll affect my constituents in Hotham, because the, the frank reality is that a lot of people in Hotham are going to be quite a lot worse off because of what is in this budget. Um, and I do want uh, the House to take note of that and to understand it. Um, speaker, I represent a, a wonderful patch of our country in the southeastern suburbs of Melbourne. Uh, many, many thousands of families um, have made their home in Hotham. Some are doing very well. Others struggle a great deal. Um, and it is those families, Deputy Speaker, the families that are struggling most in my community who are being asked to do most of the heavy lifting uh, in this budget. And I want to reflect a little bit on the policies that will, ref uh, will affect them. Um, I'll start by just um, running through some of the impacts on families in my electorate. Um, so the childcare changes in the budget are the ones that uh, we've kind of seen the government uh, putting out there, of course, the most. Um, Deputy Speaker, all political parties in Australia today agree on something, this is a, a seismic uh, thing for the nation, that childcare is not delivering what we need it to. It's not delivering what families need. It's not delivering us the workforce participation outcomes that we want to see. And very importantly, it is not delivering the early learning that will give Australian children the best possible start in life. So here was an opportunity to take this really important policy area that's so critical for the development of Australia's children uh, and do something really good and make this into a system that really works. Um, but that's not what we saw in the budget. What we saw was some additional funding for families who want to access childcare, and that's basically it. Now, additional funding for families is fantastic, but of course, with this government, what we see is as they give with one hand, they take with the other. We saw that in two essential policies that support Australian families today, uh, especially Australian families who have young children. Um, the first is the changes to the paid parental leave scheme. Um, Deputy Speaker, I was genuinely shocked to see an area where I thought we'd finally come to a resolution, 18 weeks that the government provides on the minimum wage um, for Australian parents who are looking after their children during those first critical weeks in the life of their child. Um, Labor put that scheme in place and we were incredibly proud of it. The way the scheme was designed was that there was the 18 weeks minimum and employers could top that up if, they, uh, if employees were able to bargain for that. We saw, for example, supermarket employees like at Woolworths and Coles um, who had some weeks, I think it's something around five or six of additional weeks that the employer paid for. Now, what we saw is that the changes that uh, the government has made will mean that half of all new mums will lose funding and essentially lose some essential weeks uh, at home in the first weeks of life of their newborn. Um, 
There's a policy aspect to this, which I think is appalling. I really do. I think it's absolutely appalling. So short-sighted. But the politics of it, you know, is so awful. I mean, imagine the government provides this scheme. It's intended for use with 18 weeks at the minimum and employers top it up. And then the government comes out calling women who use the scheme in exactly the way it intended as double dippers, as committing acts of fraud, of rotting. Um, I think that that whole tenor of that debate was absolutely appalling. Um, but the policy outcomes as well are equally as tragic. Um, most of the developed world provides much longer in paid parental leave than we actually see in Australia. The United Kingdom provides 39 weeks, Sweden provides 60 weeks, Canada provides 50 weeks. And the reason that those countries do that is because having a parent at home during the first weeks and the first months of a child life is really good for the children's development. That is just the reality. That is what the evidence shows us. It is very important for infant and maternal wealth. And we've even seen that, Deputy Speaker, in the Longitudinal Study of Australian Children, one of the only um, really good longitudinal studies that's conducted in Australia, um, that mums who do spend shorter periods of time at home after the birth of their child um, are more inclined to experience severe mental distress two years after the birth of their child. So there are long-term impacts and long-term costs on the system, if we're going to be frank, um, to restricting the time that mums, or in some cases dads, have at home with their newborns. And the government has cut this program, um, claiming, that it will solve, uh, that claiming that it will save a billion dollars. What we know is that that's very unlikely because the way that they've designed the reform will fully expect private sector employers to scale back on their parental leave, leaving more mums uh, who are accessing the government scheme. So, for one thing, I think that, that it's just it's bad policy, it was bad politics, and I really do hope the government uh, backtracks and goes back to the old system. Um, we know, of course, the family tax cut, um, or the family tax benefits cuts, which was covered off in the last budget, remain in this budget. That will see some of the um, most low-income families around Australia six thousand dollars a year worse off. Um, and so, the net impact on a so-called families budget under the Abbott government is that families will lose overall about three billion dollars. That's what we see when we put forward the uh, additional funding for childcare but take away family tax benefit and uh, a paid parental leave support. So that's what a family's budget looks like, I guess, under the coalition government. Now, we shouldn't forget, um, Deputy Speaker, that in this budget, um, it's not just the new measures, that um, some of which I've described, but most of the most uh, unfair aspects of last year's budget remain in this budget. And I really do want the Australian people to understand that. This is the same budget as last year, but with some additional cuts and some additional <coughs> Uh, unfair policies put over the top. So we will still see average families $6,000 worse off. We will still see $80 billion cut from schools and health. We'll still see Christopher Pine's mad idea of his $100,000 university degrees. Um, we'll still see $5 increases to the cuts to the cost of medicine, cuts to the SBS and, ABS, uh, SBS and ABC, cuts to community legal services. Really, there are only two things in this budget uh, that have been reversed, and I think that Labor's done a terrific job in tackling some of these issues. One is the indexation um, change to pensions. That would have seen pensioners $80 a week worse off in a decade than they otherwise would have been. Um, but again, we see a bunch of other nasties there for our pensioners. A lift to the retirement age to 70, $1.3 billion in cuts to pensioner concessions, uh, $20 million in cuts to dementia initiatives, uh, the axing of the dementia supplement and, of course, the $900 senior supplement cut. I know a lot of my part pensioners um, pay their electricity bills and take care of other essentials with that funding. Uh, the second aspect is the GP tax. Um, the $7 co-payment, which was you know, so, so uh, concerning and that we've gone through, I think, three or four iterations of what policy is going to be put in place there. Instead of putting in place a, an upfront payment, um, the government instead is doing this by the back door in freezing Medicare benefits for four years uh, unless doctors uh, charge their patients additional funding. So what we see as the upshot of all this, Deputy Speaker, is that um, it's the lowest income Australian families who are bearing the brunt of this. And I'm going to quote now from the NatSem modelling, which looked at how the two budgets affect Australian families. Um, NatSem is one of the most widely uh, respected institutions that does modelling in Australia and it says the results clearly demonstrate that low-income families with children are the main family group to be adversely impacted by policy changes since the last election. Uh, I do think this is sad. I do think that um, 
that it's unfair that low-income families are the ones who bear the brunt of this and a lot of those people will be my constituents in Hotham and I condemn the budget on that basis. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I uh, thank